Hey guys, it's Danny. Alrighty, today we're gonna continue the series that we started last week titled Did You Know or something of the sorts. And today we'll talk about orchid flowers, flower spikes, buds, all sorts of things that have to do with orchid flowers. And today, even if the subject is actually super, super bushy, I'll try to cram in the video as much information as I can gathered from articles and whatever I researched, but also from personal experience. So if you enjoyed today's video, subscribe to my channel down below. I post regularly and I always share with you everything that I learn. Alrighty, let's get into the subject. Orchid flowers are indeed unique in the plant kingdom. That's why we love them and we purchase them and we're always fascinated when we see them in stores. But they have a well-defined purpose. Just like any other flower, they are made to look, smell and even feel like something pollinators will be attracted to because the main goal of the flower is to be pollinated so it can propagate the orchid further. However, orchids went to really great lengths to make sure pollination is optimal and they don't waste flowers. Therefore, in the orchid kingdom, you can find orchids with specialized flowers which attract one single pollinator. The most common of all is the Angraecum orchid, also known as the Darwin orchid. And this is a story most of us in the orchid hobby know, but let's just repeat it for those of you who are new. Some genuses of Angraecum have a really long spur, at the bottom of which the orchid forms nectar. For a pollinator to reach the nectar, it would have to have a really long proboscis. And as it just so happens, there is such a pollinator in the form of a moth with, you guessed it, a really long proboscis. This adaptation ensures that the orchid will not get pollen from all sorts of other flowers. Orchids generally have slow growth and they put a lot of energy and resources into the flowers. It's not very functional to lose flowers that you might produce only once a year. But the Angraecum is not the only orchid which is known to adapt its flowers in order to attract certain pollinators. A popular species in the orchid hobby is the Bulbophyllum. Some individuals of this genus are known to produce flowers which mimic get this, dead organic material. That's to put it lightly, to call it as it is would be decomposing flesh. They can mimic this through the shape of the flowers, the color and even smell. There are quite a few bulbophyllums in the hobby that smell absolutely foul. It's really hard to stand next to them actually. The purpose of this is to attract flies and other insects which are known to feed or breed in such type of material. Sounds a little gross, that's true. So let's get to nicer things. Luckily, in cultivation, we kept and hybridized the nicer things. Therefore, we can find a lot of orchids with incredible colors, shapes, and fragrances. One of the most popular orchids in the hobby are the Cattleya orchids. They possess some of the most beautiful fragrances in the plant kingdom. The pollinators for these orchids are insects which are attracted to nice smells. Luckily, humans are attracted to them as well. So in the hobby, you can find a whole multitude of nicely fragrant orchids. Not only species, but hybrids as well, obtained by men through mixing together various species and then hybrids and so on and so forth for quite a few decades. But we weren't only attracted to beautiful colors and fragrances. We're also attracted to the unique or the curious in the orchid world. And one of the most curious groups has to be the Paphiopetalum. Paphiopetalum flowers look like nothing in the flower shop. Well, their flower is not designed to attract potential pollinators only through flashy colors or fragrances, but they are designed to trap insects. For the longest time, people believed that these orchids are actually carnivorous and that the pouch you see on the flower is actually used in the same way a carnivorous plant uses pitchers. As it turns out, this orchid is not carnivorous and the pouch is merely used as a trapping device. But fear not, these orchids don't actually kill off their pollinators. An insect that might be attracted to the glossiness and the shape of this orchid will fall into the pitcher and in its struggle to get out, it will brush against the pollinia and the stigma and eventually it will pollinate the flower. So all that the Paphiopetalum does is just to provide an exercising device for insects. 
Orchid flowers can come in a myriad of colors and even patterns. The most common colors for orchids are pinks, yellows, whites, oranges in some cases, and all other shades in between. Patterns can include dotting, veining, splashes of color, or even solid one color flowers. There are a few colors which are very, very rare in the orchid kingdom. One of them is blue. True blue flowers are almost inexistent, and in the hobby there are only a few orchids which possess a close to blue color. Most of the orchids have a sort of purple tinge to them, and even though this orchid might appear pretty blue on camera, it's just because the camera cannot really pick up the true tone. In reality, it is a sort of indigo color. Very close to blue, but not really blue. This is a hybrid, but there are species which possess this purpley blue color, and one of the most famous one is the Dendrobium Victoria Reginae. Depending on the individual, the shade can be more close to blue or more close to purple. In any case, they are pretty rare in the hobby, and most orchids with this color are actually man-made hybrids. But there are a few Cattleya species which come close to this color as well. Typically, we call them a Cerulea variety. There are also a few Vanda orchids that come close to blue, and the most popular one is Vanda Cerulea. Again, this term is used to describe something that looks blue. But even rarer than blue is black. Currently, I'm not aware of any orchid we can grow in cultivation which is black and is a species. The closest to black we can get are with hybrids, and the most popular orchids which are known to be almost black are in the Catacetum group. Monia rara Millennium Magic is a hybrid that is so incredibly dark purple that to the naked eye, it really appears black. You would have to put this orchid against the sun to see the purpleness in it. Also, if you boost a little bit the exposure on the camera, you can see it as dark purple. This is not the only hybrid in cultivation which appears black, but it is one of the few. As a species, we have the Brassiliorchis shunkiana, which can produce flowers close to the color black, but again, in this case, we can see that the flowers are actually a very dark purple. So now that we know a little bit about the purpose of flowers, let's talk practice. Most of us are acquainted with orchid flowers that are displayed on a flower spike, because the Phalaenopsis orchid, which produces a flower spike, is so common that I bet you most of us believed at some point that orchids are only limited to Phalaenopsis. And for the main part, most orchids in cultivation display their flowers on a flower spike. In the case of the Phalaenopsis, we can see flowers are arranged on each side of the flower spike. But these spikes are not the same with all orchids. Some flower spikes are extremely short and are produced in the crown of the orchid structure. This is typical for sympodial orchids, which are orchids that produce pseudobulbs or fans connected through a rhizome. We call the crown spikes terminal spikes, but this is not the only way sympodial orchids can bloom, of course. Flower spikes can be produced from a node existing on the cane or on the pseudobulb, or we can have a multitude of flowers displayed all along the cane or the pseudobulb. At this point, it really just depends on the orchid. Frustratingly enough, the production of the flower spike can take quite a bit of time. There are orchids which mature and open buds within two months from the formation of the flower spike. But you can wait more than that. Some oncidiums can take four to five months to completely mature flower spikes and open the flowers. Typically, the shorter the flower spike, the faster the buds will open. Even in the world of the Phalaenopsis orchid, with standard flower shop Phalaenopsis, we can wait up to four months for the flowers to open. With the novelty Phalaenopsis, which are closer to species, the wait can take up to two months. With many orchids, when flowers first open, they appear much smaller than they will end up to be. This is because the flowers need to stretch for a few days until they reach their final size. This happens especially with Phalaenopsis orchids, but also with Vanda orchids. So if your Vanda displays tiny little flower, just give her a few days, it will stretch to its full capacity. Some flowers can open up a color and end up in a week or so with a different color. We call these the color changers and especially the Cattleya Kingdom is known to do this. 
I do have a video on color changing flowers, so if you want to learn more about this aspect, you can visit the description below and you'll find the link there. As it ages, typically the flower comes into its own. It reaches size, it reaches color, and it also reaches fragrance. In many cases, when they first open, orchid flowers are not fragrant. This gives us a lot of scares in the orchid hobby because we purchase orchids without flowers in the hopes that we will have a beautiful fragrance and when the orchid first opens, we smell nothing. Don't worry, the fragrance usually kicks in after a few days. In some cases, even after a week. In some cases, particularly with Phalaenopsis orchids, from the moment the first bud opens till the last opens, a lot of time can pass, even a few weeks. The first flowers that open are bigger than the last, they might have a better color and they might have fragrance in comparison to the latest flowers that open. In the process, we can even lose some buds, as you can see here. We call this bud blast and it's a phenomenon that sadly happens pretty often in cultivation, although we dread it. Bud blast refers to the yellowing and shriveling of the buds before they even open. There are a few reasons why buds do this. I do have a video where I talk about how to maintain the flowers on orchids for longer periods of time. And I do touch base with bud blast as well. So if you're interested in learning more, check the description down below yet again, you'll find a link towards that video there. When will we have blooms on our orchids? It really depends on the orchid. If we know Phalaenopsis orchids, we're used to the idea that usually they produce one new flower spike per year, but there are orchids which can produce multiple flower spikes per year depending on the growth pattern. So some orchids might bloom in particular seasons, they might bloom once a year in that season, or they can bloom throughout the year, no matter the season. These are the orchids that we actually like, and typically on Cidium orchids are known to do this. Catacetum type orchids are known to only bloom once a year. And depending on the species, variety, or even cross, they typically bloom in fall, winter, or even spring. Speaking about reblooming, an orchid flower spike can continue to bloom after the initial flush of flowers is gone. It can continue to grow from the top or produce secondary spikes. Phalaenopsis orchids are notorious to do this and I do have a video down below in the description yet again where I talk more about cutting the flower spike, where to cut it if you want certain outcomes and so on. So I'm not gonna focus on the Phalaenopsis now, there are a few other orchids which are known to behave like Phalaenopsis. Telumnias are one of them. As you can see I have an initial flush of blooms here but I also have a tiny little branch just forming. So I'll have a secondary flush of blooms. But this behavior is not as common as you might think. In my entire collection of around 250 orchids, I only have the Phalaenopsis and the Tulumnias, which do this. Even though Oncidium orchids can have branches as well, they don't have secondary sequential branches that come after the initial flush of blooms. You might have heard me say a new word there, sequential. There are orchids in cultivation which can bloom over and over and over again from the very same flower spike. And the most notorious one is the Cycopsis. On the top of each flower spike, there is only one flower. When that flower fades in about three weeks to a month, another bud starts to swell and eventually will bloom again. Each flower spike can live and continue to bloom for years and years to come. So in the case of the Cycopsis orchid, it's really not a good idea to cut that flower spike if it's not dry. But sequential blooming again is not something typical or extremely spread in the orchid kingdom. And by this I mean the orchid kingdom that we can grow in our house. There are so many species that I'd better not generalize. Calia orchids are known not to be sequential bloomers, not to have branching flower spikes and so on. When the show is done, it's done and you need to wait for another flower spike to form. Likewise, Vandas are not known to be sequential bloomers or to have branching flower spikes. So in this regard, there are only a few orchids which are known to continue blooming throughout the year over and over again from the same flower spike. Now, orchid flowers typically last in bloom anywhere from a month to four months. 
Thunder blooms last for a little over a month or even a little under a month. Cattleya flowers are known to last for about two weeks, three weeks, maximum a month and a half, while Phalaenopsis orchids can maintain blooms for even four months. And if you consider that they are sequential bloomers and they can branch out, you can have a Phalaenopsis complex hybrid, the one you find in flower shops, in bloom for a total amount of a year. That's actually how much I had one in bloom, but I know cases in which Phalaenopsis were in bloom continuously for a year and a half. The display of flowers is beautiful no matter how you arrange it. Typically Phalaenopsis orchids are staked due to space economy reasons and protection of the flowers on transport and displays. But you can obviously not stake flower spikes. Typically orchid displays are pendant, the ones that produce multiple flowers and especially with epiphytic orchids, which are known to grow in trees. If you consider an orchid attached to the tree, you can see why the display of flowers, it's very practical to be pendant. However, though, be careful with hybrids because they might produce an abundance of flowers, they will become heavy and they can tip the pot over, make the orchid fall and actually break the flower spike. Oh, that's a very common occurrence in the orchid hobby. We all did it. In fact, I broke a flower spike just last week. Needless to say, the blooms of this orchid are completely compromised. So if you ever break flower spikes, don't worry, we all do it. All we can do is just try to be careful next time and make sure that we don't place our orchid somewhere where the cat, the kid or even ourselves can brush against it and break flower spikes. And if we think about each genus in particular, we can talk forever about orchid flowers, flower spikes, buds and so on, but I think it's enough for today. These have been a few general ideas and I hope you find them useful or at least entertaining. So thank you so much for watching this video and hanging out with me today. And you know the drill, if you've enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for regular orchid videos. And if you'd like to be notified whenever I post a video, just click Click that notification bell and YouTube will let you know of my uploads. And with that said, I'll see you all next time. Bye!